Okay. Once again, uh, we are we are uh, really pleasured to have a fabulous speaker uh, who uh, is not only a good speaker, uh, but he's he's extremely well known. Uh, he's, uh, his latest book is he's, he's has several bestsellers, but his latest book is. Um, uh, Ten Steps to Better Vision, is that how it goes? Ten Essentials to Save Your Sight. That was yeah, close. Ten Essentials to Save Your Sight. Okay, I've read it. It's an excellent book. Uh, it covers all kinds of things. Great for any 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 patient. You know, one, one, one of the things that's hard for me is you know, patients come in and say, you got a treatment for glaucoma, you got a treat. I'm good with macular degeneration, because he also wants to go with that, but, uh, you know, glaucoma, cataracts, uh, so forth and so on. You know, I don't really know much of what to tell them. That book is, is pretty helpful and a good book to give to your patients so you're working with those conditions. Um, uh, Ed also has, uh, has been uh, uh, having a radio show uh, called Healthy Eyes or something, right? Healthy Vision Talk Radio. Healthy Vision Talk Radio. And uh, uh, he's been doing that for like 15 years or something. And. Uh, He's also the next president of AHIMA. <laughs> Bruce, you know about that, don't you? He's running for it. He's got a big Oh, okay. I thought he was a shoe in. <laughs> oh, okay. Well, either way, I'm happy with how that comes out. You can't lose on those. What is AHIMA? That's Arizona Homeopathic and Integrated Medical Association. Uh, if you're not a member, we have the same thing in uh, Nevada, so you put an N there and it's called Enema. <laughs> so, we're just uh, we're ready for the fecal implants any minute in the round. Okay, anyhow, so let's give a warm uh, 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 welcome to Ed Condra. He's going to talk to us about some of the amazing research he's been doing and tell us all about eyes. Thanks, Ed. Can I turn this on? Slide? No, the screen just went blank. Oh, you can't see it, huh? <laughs> yes. Nice. Uh, well, I really have to give thanks to Robert Rowan. Every year, uh, Bob Rowan and I, we take a grueling week hike. And this was eight years ago. He introduced me to OZA, auto hemotherapy. And I didn't know anything about it. So eight years ago, thanks to Bob Rowan, I began doing um, ozone therapy in my practice. And then more recently, uh, this was two years ago, he really raved about rectal inflation ozone. I hadn't been doing that in my practice, and now it's a really big part of my practice. And I love the rectal inflation, because I really believe in empowering patients. And this is something they can do at home on a regular basis to really help improve their eyesight. And the good news is, I believe it's this year when we do our manly one-week hike, that Dr. Frank Schellenberger is going to be joining us. So I told Frank, Better start getting in shape now because this is not a girly hike, this is a serious hike. <laughs> I recently moved to Florida from Arizona, and I miss the state of Arizona, although I've been encouraged to run for president of AHIMA. <laughs> uh, we have a beautiful wellness center uh, right north of Tampa, Florida, and this has been my dream to have a facility where I could accommodate patients for a week when they do different therapies, so we do everything we can to improve their vision and their eyesight. And just to note, uh, the swimming pool is ozonated. So it's wonderful, because I think you do have a therapeutic effect uh, with ozone in the pool. Um, I was surprised at how inexpensive it is to get your pool ozonated. I had a consultant come out to look at the pool, and of course, if they look at this 50-acre ranch with this beautiful facility, I was scared what, they, what price they would quote me. And he looked at everything and told me, well, it's going to be five. And I thought, 5000 It's only $500. $500 to ozonate an extremely large pool like that. It's just wonderful because there's no chlorine. On the ranch, we're very active. And this is one of the reasons they had me speak on the veterinary day. Uh, because of all our animals, we have chickens, uh, cows, pigs. We have 50 goats on our ranch. Uh, we have... Uh, a big organic garden. This is one of this is my favorite goat, Anna Marie. She's the only goat to let me milk her. And this is me and my John Deere tractor. 
So in addition to being a, a farmer on the ranch, I also did a little bit of work with the eye. Uh, my background is uh, I'm a board, I'm board certified in ophthalmology. I'm also a certified classical homeopath. And that's my true love is homeopathy. I'm also a fellow of the College of Syntonic Light Therapy. And those of you that have not explored light therapy, it's a wonderful modality. The first weekend in May, the College of Syntonic Optometry has their annual meeting. Uh, look it up online. It's a phenomenal meeting to really help you with light. Light is very powerful. It's an important modality in my practice. I have a homeopathic license in Arizona, medical license in Arizona, California, Pennsylvania, and Florida. Uh, the last time I was in Texas, believe it or not, I was at a goat camp in Brady, Texas. One week intensive training on how to take care of goats. Since we got 50 goats, uh, it's uh, a lot of work, but it's a lot of fun. And today, uh, my ranch hand texted me. Uh, one of our goats gave birth to three kids, and those little kids are just so adorable. I'd like to give everybody a, a, a special gift. If you don't have my book, I'd like to give it to you. Uh, just email me uh, with your mailing address. Uh, send it to info at healing the eye, and that's healing.theyee.com. And I'd be happy to send you a book. If you want more than one book, uh, ask me for how many you, you want in your practice because it's a great book for those of you that want to get involved with treating the eye with alternative therapies. Keep it at your desk. And when a patient comes in with macular glaucoma, you can refer to the chapter on ozone therapy, chelation, intravenous vitamins, and use it as an educational tool. Um, I, think, I think it's a phenomenal book because I wrote it, but I also think it can be really helpful for uh, you as an alternative physician and also um, for your patients. Info at Healing the Eye. So what do these have in common? Cardiovascular system, pulmonary, digestive, neurological, endocrine, and most of you feel comfortable in treating these systems. Although maybe when somebody comes in with an eye problem, you don't know what to do. Well, the thing they all have in common is they all support the eye. So whatever you're doing for, with these systems to support them, you're also helping the ocular system and the visual system. There's a major increase in eye disease worldwide. And why is this happening? Can homeopathic laws explain this increase? This has been a topic of interest of mine. According to the American Academy of Ophthalmology, and this is kind of interesting, I belong, I hope to uh, become certified in the AAO, T. I'm a member of the AAO. Now I'm going to be a member of two organizations called AAO. Um, cataracts, diabetic retinopathy, glaucoma, age-related macular degeneration are expected to dramatically increase from 28 million today to 43 million by the year 2020. And these folks need help. And unfortunately, my colleagues in traditional ophthalmology are not helping the majority of these patients. In fact, in many cases, they're causing more harm, just like we see with a lot of the traditional medical doctors using pharmaceutical products, surgery, and procedures that are truly not helping patients. Uh, this is a cross-section of a normal eye, and most of the patients I see in my practice have macular degeneration. This is the part of the retina that has a very high metabolic rate. And often uh, patients will come in with fairly good health, but they'll have macular changes. So it's kind of like a barometer what's going on with the general health of the body. Uh, the optic nerve is also an important part that all alternative doctors should be looking at because uh, there are many uh, pathological conditions that take place in the optic nerve that chelation therapy, ozone therapy, and all the modalities that you're doing can greatly help these patients. In particular, glaucoma. Glaucoma is really a, not a disease of eye pressure. It's a disease of dysfunction of the optic nerve. Then we have this segment of the front part of the eye, uh, the human lens uh, right here in the cornea. External diseases do remarkably well with ozone therapy. Probably the most important thing that I've introduced into my practice is ozonated saline drops. 
helps patients with dry eyes, chronic inflammation, corneal ulcers. This is the cross-section of the retina, and the retina has an extremely vascular layer called choroid, has a really high blood flow. And this is one of the reasons why when we do autohemotherapy, hydrogen peroxide, or rectal ozone, when we get that ozone into the blood system, we get an extremely high concentration, extremely high flow behind the eye, and this is what I feel can really benefit, or why we have such good success with macular degeneration. Although my interest is in actually delivering ozone gas on the other side of the retina, this is inside the eye, the uh, intravitreal, actually putting a needle in the eye, and this is the most common method of delivering anti-VEGF factors that eye surgeons use now, delivering uh, Avastin was sent this by injecting it directly into the eye. So the symptoms of macular degeneration, loss of central vision is slow, painless, usually mild, uh, central blind spots, and symptoms are usually bilateral. One comment I'd like to make is, I feel very strongly that before you treat anyone with an eye problem, make sure you have a good diagnosis. Um, if the patient comes in and tells you of that macular degeneration or glaucoma or whatever, cataract, get a copy of their most recent eye examination. Um, I've almost been burned a couple of times. I can recall a patient come to, into my office who had cataracts. I had a recent eye exam. Well, I actually had his eye exam about a year ago, but he didn't want me to examine his eye. When I did examine his eye, I discovered he had a rectal detachment. And I said, thank God I examined him because if I would have done some controversial treatments on him, and then he went back to his eye doctor, his traditional ophthalmologist, and said, oh my God, you have a rectal detachment. Dr. Kondrat probably caused it with ozone. You know, it's like indefensible. So if you are treating an eye condition, make sure the patient comes in with a recent eye examination that you can look at and review and have, have you know, cover yourself. Findings on eye examination, uh, pigment changes in the macula, drusen. Drusen are accumulation of waste products. Uh, they're like little warts on the back of the eye. And you also see areas of choroidal uh, retinal atrophy. And this is an example here of drusen, uh, these little warty growths on the back of the eye. This is an example of a uh, retinal hemorrhage, a wet macular degeneration. And I have found that both uh, wet and dry respond well to ozone therapy, micro microcurrent, and light therapy. Initially, when I started treating eye problems with alternative therapies, I mainly stuck with the dry macular degeneration. But now I feel both conditions can respond very well. And here's another example of drusen in the eye and kind of the wavy changes that occur uh, due to the distortion in the back of the eye. We have different methods of testing. Uh, the Amsler grid is where we document where the waviness is in the eye. Now let's look at the front part of the eye. In glaucoma, uh, we have an increase in intraocular pressure. This is where the aqueous is produced in the ciliary body. And usually it's some type of a blockage in the eye flow area called the trabecular meshwork. Um, and as I mentioned earlier, that glaucoma is more than an increase in the intraocular pressure. It has to do with the dysfunction of the optic nerve. The diagnosis of glaucoma is extremely difficult. Uh, the pressure is usually elevated, but not always. There's a condition called low tension glaucoma. There's visual film changes, loss of peripheral vision, and changes in the optic nerve. I attended a meeting at the Baskin Palmer Eye Institute last month and it was on new treatments for glaucoma, and Baskin Palmer is one of the top eye institutes in the country. And one of the uh, directors of the program got up, who he has glaucoma, and he made the comment, I wish that I would have tried everything possible to preserve my vision. They admitted at the meeting that glaucoma eye drops do not stop the progression of glaucoma. They only slow the progression. And glaucoma is a very serious disease that can lead to total blindness. And this is one group of patients that can benefit extremely well from our, our, our alternative treatments. 
oxidative treatments, microcurrent, uh, detoxification, and these people are really seeking help because the eye drops are just so toxic. They have red eyes, they're miserable, they're progressively losing vision, and alternative therapies can save these people. One of the parameters that we use uh, are computerized visual fields to measure the state and health of the eye. This is an example of glaucomatous field loss. Usually in glaucomatous field loss, you have an altitudinal defect, either inferior or superior, like these illustrate. While in a neurological problem with a stroke, you tend to have a uh, hemianopic, um, more of a uh, vertical loss. These are changes in the optic nerve. Those of you that use an ophthalmoscope, um, whoop, uh, and you can see here, one of the changes is an increased size of the cup. But this is extremely difficult to monitor patients, and most ophthalmologists do not monitor by simple observation of the optic nerve. We now have instruments to measure the nerve fiber layer. There's over 100 million little nerve fibers in the eye. Every rod and cone sends a fiber to the area of the optic nerve. We can measure the thickness of the optic nerve right uh, in this area here. And essentially, we're measuring the health of the eye. We're measuring the thickness of all these little nerve fibers. And one of the reasons why you get loss of peripheral vision in glaucoma is the longer fibers that go all the way out to the periphery die first. They have a greater nutritional need compared to the short fibers near the central part. And this is an instrument we use. Uh, it's ocular coherence uh, tomography. It very accurately measures uh, the thickness of the optic nerve, and we can measure uh, the success or failures of our treatment. So why are we seeing an increase in eye problems? Probably for the same reason we're seeing an increase in cardiovascular and decline of general health in our country. I think it, a lot has to do with our nutrition, uh, use of preservatives, chemicals, uh, genetically modified organisms, and heavy metal poisoning. And there's been many articles. One article reported that lead and uh, cadmium accumulated in the human ocular tissue. And just about everybody I see with cataracts or macular degeneration, they do have elevated lead. And I would encourage all of you to do a six-hour urine challenge test, identify the problem, and begin the appropriate treatment. And of course, I think big pharma is uh, contributing to the increase in eye disease. And I think the big uh, contribution or the big problem is suppression. If you study homeopathy, you understand if you don't treat disease properly and you just treat it superficially, you push the disease deeper into the body. And we have suppression with antibiotics, the overuse of antibiotics, uh, for example, in treating chronic uh, blepharitis, uh, the overuse of steroid eye drops, Cataract surgery can be suppressive. There's been a study done in the ophthalmic literature shows that there's an increased incidence of macular degeneration after cataract surgery, and I think this is due to suppression. Laser surgery and injections. Uh, these injections that they're doing for wet macular degeneration are horrible. They really don't do anything to treat the underlying problem, and patients need repeated injections, I think, that are hazardous, and it really destroys the function of the eye. So here's an example of a perioleal conjunctivitis. And uh, if this person would go to the emergency room, first line treatment would be antibiotics and steroids. You know, a topical ozone could take care of this case. Steroids are the most commonly prescribed drug to treat inflammation in the eye. And there's many side effects listed for using steroids. But from the homeopathic perspective, these are not side effects, but I think they're the results of suppression. We have increased intraocular pressure, cataracts, other infections, herpes simplex, and corneal ulcers. All can be related to the use of steroid and eye drops. We have antibiotic suppression. Overgrowth of non-susceptible organisms can retard corneal wound healing, punctate keratitis, erythema, increased lacrimation, edema, and lead itching. Glaucoma eye drops, I think, are suppressive. Um, they actually suppress the natu natural production of aqueous humor, which is essential in the eye for transporting oxygen and nutrients to the eye. So what the eye doctor does 
It gives a pharmaceutical drop to stop aqueous production and lower the pressure. It's much like someone, if you see, has high blood pressure, and you tell them, we're going to treat the high blood pressure by destroying uh, your bone marrow uh, so you no longer get production of red blood cells. Cataract surgery, I believe, can be suppressive. And I'm not totally against cataract surgery, but I think a lot of cataract surgery that is done is unnecessary. Uh, that, um, when, and there was three major population uh, studies that were done, and the incidence of macular degeneration was found to be 1.7 times higher after cataract surgery. This was published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology. And often when I see a patient in my office who has macular degeneration, when I take my history, I find out they were doing well, they had cataract surgery six months ago, they had excellent vision, but three months later they developed macular degeneration. The traditional ophthalmic profession looks at that as it's just an aging eye. They're going to get back into the generation anyway. I feel it's been a suppression. The underlying problem was not treated adequately and they just pushed the disease to a deeper layer going from cataract to macular degeneration. So I'd like to talk about my uh, Restore Vision program that begins with a three-day boot camp. I call it a boot camp because we do everything we can to help turn a patient's vision around. And also during this boot camp, we like to find out what modalities are most beneficial to the patient. Also during this boot camp, we educate patients. So when they go home, they can use their microcurrent, they can use their oxidative therapies at home. And typically they will continue with microcurrent, syntonic light therapy, and uh, rectal ozone. So these are the modalities that I use. I use microcurrent, intravenous nutrition, oxidative treatments, and light therapy. The microcurrent machine that I use, and this is probably the fourth uh, company that I've dealt with, is Inspirstar. This has been the first programmable, portable microcurrent machine. And the latest in microcurrent technology is something called frequency specific where not only do we deliver a low current into the eye to help stimulate blood flow and stimulate cellular activity, we also try to match the frequency of the microcurrent with the frequency of the eye tissue. And using this approach, I seem to get the best results. So once we identify what frequencies are best suited for the patient, whether they have wet macular degeneration, dry or glaucoma, then we can program their machine for those specific frequencies for them to take home and use on a daily basis. And this is a picture of the uh, Inspirstar microcurrent. This is how we deliver the therapy using a washcloth and electroconductive gloves. The electroconductive gloves are wrapped inside the washcloth and we deliver the current going from the eye to the back of the neck. Uh, 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 light therapy is a big part of the practice. And uh, this is uh, from the College of Syntonic Optometry. This is the light device we use. It's interesting, um, this just uses non-coherent light. I also use cold laser in the office, near, near red and infrared laser, which I also find to have, I see benefit with macular degeneration and glaucoma. Uh, Dr. Tina Karu, who's a Russian, looked at the difference between uh, coherent light, the laser light, and non-coherent light, which the College of Syntonic uses. And she studied this in uh, vitro uh, and determined that there was really no difference affecting cellular metabolism, looking at non-coherent versus coherent light. The difference is that the coherent light or the cold laser, the infrared laser, penetrates deeper into the tissue. So this is a remarkable therapy, the syntonic light treatment. And this organization has been in existence for 75 years. And as I mentioned, they have a great meeting the first weekend in May. If you want an introduction, uh, Google syntonic phototherapy or email me and I'll give you the information on that. And this is some example. The syntonic light therapy basically deals with balancing the autonomic nervous system. Our goal, which I think is really critical, is to balance that autonomic nervous system before any healing takes place. And green uh, is in the center of what they call the balance beam. And uh, the 
uh, orange, yellow, and red is the sympathetic, and the blue is the parasympathetic. The basic colors that I use are mu delta, which is yellow, green, that's usually for chronic conditions, and most of the patients that I see have a chronic problem, and we use this filter, mu delta. It also has a detoxification effect, which is great. The other most common one is epsilon omega, uh, which is, or no, I'm sorry, mu epsilon, which is blue-green, and this is for acute sy syndrome. So if somebody has a sudden loss of vision, uh, an ocular bleed, a migraine headache, an acute problem, we want to quiet the autonomic nervous system, and we use mu epsilon, which is blue-green. So day one of uh, my boot camp, we do a brain balancing and a stress program. These are both microcurrent programs that help uh, balance the neurological centers. And uh, also we, we reduce stress. That's before we even begin to treat the person. Then we have a customized eye program. This is determined by my evaluation, whether it's wet macular degeneration, dry, glaucoma, cataracts. Uh, we also do a detox program. Everybody will get a six-hour urine, uh, a urine challenge test for heavy metals. And not only will we put them on a detox, detoxification program, we will also put some detox fre microcurrent frequencies. There's a naturopathic doctor who's been doing some studies looking at microcurrent frequencies for lead, arsenic, cadmium. She has demonstrated that after microcurrent, there is a positive response based on a six-hour urine challenge test following these patients. I don't think the microcurrent therapy actually replaces our conventional treatments like chelation, but I do think it's a good adjunctive treatment. Uh, nutritional IVs are very important. Uh, most of the patients I see are extremely nutritionally deficient. Uh, we give them a customized Mars cocktail uh, based on, on additional ingredients that are really beneficial for their eye like taurine and folic acid, uh, and I call it the vision cocktail. And these are the oxidative treatments that we use in the practice. Uh, hydrogen peroxide and rectal insufflation. I've had, I have used autohemotherapy, and that's what I think is so wonderful about this meeting. I really have a lot of ideas, and I'm gonna probably be changing my oxidative parameters, because I do think uh, that I could probably get more bang for my buck by doing something a little bit more aggressive than simple hydrogen peroxide. But I love the rectal insufflation. When patients come to the boot camp, they get two rectal insufflations a day, one in the morning, one in the afternoon. I think it has a tremendous therapeutic effect. And at the same time, they're educated on how to do it. And then so when they go home at the end of the program, they're confident in doing these therapies on their own. And we also do symphonic uh, color therapy on all the patients. Uh, day two is uh, uh, very similar, uh, except I do a constitutional homeopathic evaluation, and we do the same treatments, and day three is pretty much a repeat. But during the three days, we kind of customize things depending on how the patient reacts. I may change the microcurrent frequency or current, uh, make, make some alterations in the volume of the ozone, same thing with the hydrogen peroxide. And at the end of day three, we repeat all the diagnostic testings we did on day one to determine what type of success they had with the program. Now in terms of ozone, uh, the methods of administration that I'm using in my practice right now are topical, uh, which I love. Uh, patients with dry eyes and chronic irritation, it's just extremely beneficial. Uh, retro bulbar, I haven't re really seen any advantages of retrobulbar over autohemotherapy or hydrogen peroxide or rectal. In some situations, I think that it is indicated, and I'll talk about that a little later, but my favorite right now is rectal. Um, uh, and uh, I have a big interest in intra intravitreal, and I'll talk a little later about some animal studies that I'm doing with intravitreal. Uh, we use the CATS ozonator. It's very simple, it's affordable for patients. If they want to take something home with dry eyes, um, we tell them to use a glass container, um, a canning jar, something glass, and we make certain that they only use preservative-free saline. And since preservative-free saline is so difficult to obtain, you can't find it in the pharmacy, but it's so expensive, 
we sell them our uh, saline bags to the patient. They love it because we give it to them at a good price and we know it's a good source of saline. And then we give them a small uh, eyedropper bottle that they put the saline in. Unfortunately, it only lasts uh, maybe a half a day or so if they keep it refrigerated. There may be some residual ozone in the bottle the next day that I instruct them to make it. Um, I was trained to use a 22 gauge needle. Do not use anything smaller than a 22 because a smaller needle, you're not going to be able to fill the tissue. And the big danger, of course, you're going to go into the globe of the eye. Um, and I've been using, for my retro bulbers, I've been using uh, 24 uh, gamma of saline gas. Uh, this is a mistake right here. I've done the retro bulbar injections both uh, with saline, uh, bubbling uh, the ozone in, in uh, ozonated saline, and pure ozone. I don't like getting the gas injection because a lot of times you'll get dissection of the gas that comes out anteriorly and will get a lot of swelling of the eyelid. Uh, so I prefer using ozonated saline for this procedure. This is uh, the hydrogen peroxide uh, that I use. And this is the uh, bag for rectal inflation. These are the concentrations that I'm using. Uh, 10 gamma for the ozone eye drops. It's probably much lower than that. Uh, I have experimented with increasing um, the gamma with the eye drops. I don't think there's any more beneficial effect with the high, higher gamma. Patients tend to tolerate it when it's a much lower gamma. Uh, 24 gamma for soft tissue retrobulbar, 40 gamma for rectal, and the 70 gamma for uh, autoimmune therapy. These are some of the conditions that I've treated over the last uh, eight years or so. Uh, corneal ulcers, tysis bulbi, which is kind of an eye that's dying. Uh, blepharitis responds very well. Iritis, uh, glaucoma, macular holes, uh, macular degeneration. Uh, both wet and dry. It's very important uh, that you do pre-ozone testing. Those of you that do treat eye problems, you should buy yourself a visual acuity chart and get some baseline visions. It's one thing when you treat a patient and they go, oh doc, it helped my vision, I'm seeing better. You have no idea. It's almost like treating somebody with high blood pressure and saying, Oh, I think you helped my high blood pressure, Doc. My headache isn't, isn't that bad. And you say, well, you helped the blood pressure. You need to take a vision. And also, it protects yourself medically and legally. If you could have a patient with a blind eye, and you're doing your treatment, and he claims, doctor, no, I can't see out of my eye. I think you caused blindness. You have no record of what he was before your ozone treatment. So please protect yourself. In addition, we do contrast testing, which I would encourage all of you to do. It's simple. Contrast testing is a good reflection on the toxic levels of the body. And so many of our therapies do reduce the toxic load. And these patients will get an improvement of their contrast sensitivity. It's a simple test. Uh, color testing should be done. Uh, visual fields. I have a simple way that you can do color uh, visual field testing right in your office without buying a $16,000 visual field machine. Uh, intraocular pressure is probably beyond the scope of most of you here, but you can buy electronic devices that treat or measure the intraocular pressure. They're very simple to use, and that uh, even a caveman could take a, an eye pressure. Uh, a dilated, uh, you know, check the pupil reactions to make sure you don't have a, uh, a afferent or a Marcus gun, which indicates, you know, a, an optic nerve problem, and they all should have a dilated exam. But a good shortcut in your practice is just make sure that these folks are examined by an optometrist or an ophthalmologist before they see you. So if you get a phone call, I've got macular degeneration, can you help me? Sure, I can help you. Bring in a recent copy of your eye examination. Then it's done. Then you don't have to go through all this stuff. So we use uh, the Early Treatment Diabetic Retinopathy Study Chart. This is a chart that's approved in all national eye institute studies and in FDA trials. It's a great eye chart because it's not like the big E chart. You know, you have five letters on each line and it's logarithmic, so you're able to get an actual measurement of vision. So if they can't see it from 10 feet, move them up five feet to just record something. 
And this is the contrast sensitivity test. This is a standard test where each letter becomes lighter and lighter. And this is a good reflection on the toxic load, especially heavy metals. And I think there's a, a few integrative dentists that are using this routinely in their dental examination to measure for mercury toxicity. And this is uh, uh, what I recommend for visual film testing. It's a simple device, and I use uh, crayons. I have them focused, and I move different colors from the periphery, and I measure their peripheral field. This is one example of a color field. Now, uh, this is an example of uh, the increase in visual field after treatment. And usually I categorize the increase of 0 to 5% minimal, 5 to 10 uh, moderate, greater than 10% a marked improvement. And I have seen visual fields increase 200 to 300% after three days of treatment, which is really dramatic for the patient when they actually see their visual field expanding. This can be one of the most sensitive methods to evaluate your success. It's a little tedious to get a baseline visual field, but you'll get a lot of mileage out of this when you re-measure them at the end of three days or you re-measure them after your course of treatment. So an example of blepharitis, extremely responsive to ozone, extremely common condition. Um, so many people have chronic blepharitis, which is leading then to chronic irritation of the eye, chalazians, styes, um, corneal ulcers, etc. Ozone, great therapy for this. Ozone eye drops, um, olive oil, ozonated olive oil on the eyelids. Uh, dry eyes. Dry eyes has been one of the most gratifying uh, uh, conditions for me to treat now with ozone eye drops. The patients love it. They come in, they're having allergic reactions to commercial eye drops, and I teach them how to make their own ozone eye drops. And I think not only does it help relieve the symptoms, I think it also helps regenerate some of the ocular structures that are producing tears. Um, and I have seen patients, after using ozonated eye drops, get an increase in their Schirmer's test. The Schirmer's test is a diagnostic test to measure the severity of the dry eyes. We put a little piece of litmus paper in the eye and we measure how much tear they're producing. After uh, ozone therapy, their ocular tear function seems to be returning. This is not a really good slide of a corneal ulcer. Uh, the corneal ulcers can be treated with ozonated eye drops or in that more severe case, jerry rigging swimming goggles or putting saline inside to make sure the eyes bathe constantly. This is a case I treated a, a Tysus ball by. The ophthalmic surgeon wanted to remove this guy's eye. It was painful, discomforting, so I had him come into the office every day and I gave him a retro ball bar injection of ozonated saline every day. And he was so grateful because we saved the eye, his pain went away, and to me it was a really gratifying uh, course of treatment for him. So the, uh, I'd like to go over the outcomes of the three-day boot camp, and this is uh, patients that I've treated uh, from 2011, not to 10-12. I went back in time. This is a retrospective study. <laughs> we treated 151 uh, patients. This is a breakdown of conditions. The majority of them had dry macular. Next was glaucoma, wet macular hole wrinkling, Stargardt's disease, which is a congenital form of macular degeneration which occurs in teenagers, uh, cataracts, ischemic optic nerve disease, retinitis pigmentosa, which is very responsive to ozone and alternative treatments. And this is a really gratifying group here, the retinitis pigmentosa. Diabetic retinopathy. For some reason, I don't see a lot of diabetic retinopathy in my practice. I should. It's such an uh, end epidemic out there of patients with diabetes and diabetic retinopathy, but I really don't see that much. Histoplasmosis, rectal scar, and cone dystrophy. So this is the results overall of all 302 eyes treated. Ten or more letters uh, were in uh, 50 eyes. Now, you may not appreciate an improvement of 10 letters, but in the Lancet Medical Journal, uh, recently they published a study of a patient with Stargardt's disease that received embryonic stem cells. The patient was treated over a three-month period, and the article was big news. This patient had an improvement of five letters of vision. 
And here we are, after three days of alternative treatment, having 10 or more letters improved. I've seen patients improve 30 or 40 letters on the eye chart after three days of treatment. I would never know the extent of treatment if I didn't get that baseline acuity. So I'm encouraging you, get the baseline acuity if you're treating an eye problem. Five or more letters, uh, 50 more, 54%. You see the majority, 69%, uh, had an improvement of five or more letters, which beats out the Lancet article. Um, no change, 8%. Uh, but you have to understand that some of the patients that I treated had perfect vision. They had macular degeneration, but they were still seeing 20-20. So I haven't really looked at the data in terms of their starting uh, visual acuity. And this is contrast improvement. Uh, five or more letters with contrast, one to four letters, no change, um, which is also significant. The really impressive result is improvement of the visual field expansion. Marked improves, improvement of over half the eyes, 57%. I'm talking about 300 to 400%, an unbelievable improvement. And now if we look at each category, this is uh, macular degeneration dry, average improvement, 5.5 letters. And this is only after three days. This is a, a long-term study, but I like patients to, I like to demonstrate to patients that these alternative therapies work when they see that then I'll be more inclined to continue the treatments over a longer period of time. Uh, acuity improvement, two lines are greater. Contrast, uh, greater than six letters. This is wet, average improvement of acuity, 6.4 letters. Uh, uh, two lines are better than breaking up. Contrast, six letters, 11 lines. Visual field expansion. Majority of them have a great expansion of the visual field. Um, current treatment of glaucoma, just to reemphasize, is crazy. Glaucoma is more than pressure. It's more about the health of the optic nerve. Anything we can do to improve perfusion of the optic nerve is what we really want to do. And of course, the toxic effect of all the petrochemical eye drops are just horrible. And you really have to wonder, uh, are the eye drops changing the course of the disease? I say they're not. It's not only my opinion, that's the opinion of some of the top glaucoma specialists in the Cask and Palmer. Uh, laser therapy for glaucoma is just a temporary procedure. Typically, laser will keep the pressure down for three to six months, and then they need to repeat laser. Surgery uh, is usually the last resort, and most of these eyes are lost after surgery. After surgery. But one thing I have to caution you, I never tell a glaucoma patient to stop their medication. Um, I think you can get into trouble. When they come to see me, I make sure they continue all their eye drops. Then we evaluate the health of their eye. It's a big mistake to claim that you can help them. You don't need your eye drops. Then they get a spike in pressure and lose their vision or maybe even go blind. So I tell them this is an ancillary treatment. Continue your eye drops. We'll evaluate you in three to six months. If you're doing better, you can gradually taper. It's much like treating um, an, an asthma patient that's on steroids. You don't want to just stop their steroids immediately and say, I'm going to help you. You want to titrate, taper the steroids over a period of time and monitor the patient. And unfortunately, if you're not an ophthalmologist, you can't monitor their pressure in your office. So it has to be a coordinated effort with a local eye doctor that they go back to the eye doctor, tell me what your pressure is, and then you can make a decision on uh, decreasing or stopping their eye drops. So in the study with my glaucoma patients, I treated 29 patients, 58 eyes. Average change in acuity was six letters, which is great. Average change in contrast, 3.6 letters. Average drop in pressure, 4.8 millimeters. So we are somehow improving the overall health of the eye, improving the outflow of the aqueous. But remember, with glaucoma, the main goal is not to lower the pressure. The main goal as an integrative doctor is to improve the overall health of the eye. So there's more perfusion, more circulation to that optic nerve. Uh, two lines are greater. Uh, we had uh, 10 eyes, um, which is contrast improvement greater than six letters, 17 eyes. Uh, no change in 10 eyes. A visual field expansion, which is very rewarding for glaucoma patients because these folks have lost a considerable amount of their peripheral vision. 
Marked improvement to 37 eyes, moderate, 14 eyes, no change or minimal to 7 eyes. So in pressure lowering, greater than 5 millimeters uh, in 12 eyes. What's really remarkable, I'll see patients who uh, are on multiple eye drops, and the ophthalmologist can't get their pressure down. And after 10 minutes of light treatment, their pressure is lowered 5 to 10 millimeters of mercury. After 10 minutes of light treatment. And this was actually published in the American Journal of Ophthalmology in 1948. They did a study looking at the effects of green light on eye pressure, and they clearly demonstrated that green light will lower the intraocular pressure. So I think glaucoma is a disease of the autonomic nervous system. And a lot of our treatments have to address the autonomic nervous system because one of the most successful treatments I have for glaucoma is the brain balancing microcurrent treatments that I did. The brain balancing, we're, we're balancing the center functions of the brain and that lowers the pressure. There was an increase in pressure in five eyes and there's a little asterisk there because some of these patients stopped their eye drops. Some of the patients came to me and their pressures were normal. They were 12 and they were taking one eye drop and I decided let's stop it because I didn't feel they even had glaucoma. And that's the problem. I see a lot of patients with glaucoma who are overdiagnosed. The medical profession, as you know, is getting into the arena of prevention. You know, take these statins to prevent a heart attack. Um, you know, and the same thing with ophthalmology. Your pressure's up a little bit. Why don't you take this eye drop to prevent glaucoma? And unfortunately, it's causing a lot more harm than good. They've never talked to the patients about doing alternative therapies and integrative treatments. Even exercise. There are studies to show that exercise will, on a regular basis, will lower your intraocular pressure if you have glaucoma. Uh, Stargardt's disease, this is a, a, a small series of only three patients, uh, but this was very rewarding because Stargardt's occurs in young individuals, uh, college age individuals, and uh, to get this kind of improvement um, is very rewarding. All of them had a uh, uh, a marked improvement of their visual field. Retinitis pigmentosa is a disease of the rods of the eye and patients lose their peripheral vision, so they end up looking through a small tunnel. So what you need to really look at in, in this study here is um, the visual field expansion. Uh, the average acuity was 15.3 letters better. I mean, that is huge. That's three lines on the eye chart. And uh, they had Four, four eyes had marked expansion. Now, when you expand the visual field of a retinitis pigmentosa patient, they are unbelievably grateful because they're looking through a little tube. And um, very good results with retinitis pigmentosa. Um, macular hole, macular wrinkle, macular pucker. This is probably one of the more difficult conditions that I've experienced in treating. I think this is uh, due to uh, a toxic reaction of the eye, and as a group, the average acuity change was the smallest, uh, although, and also the visual field expansion. This is a really tough group to treat, uh, macular hole, macular pucker. Cataracts are interesting because I really don't think that I changed the cataracts in three days. I don't think I did anything to change the density of the lens. I think I, what I did was with these integrated therapies is just to improve the health of the eye, not improve the vision. So sometimes the pathology doesn't change, but the function does. And of course, that's what we're after. We want to improve the function of these patients. Um, and uh, so it was a 5.75 letters, marked a visual field expansion uh, seven in seven eyes out of the 10. Schemic optic neuropathy, uh, uh, average acuity improvement was uh, 5.75 letters. Uh, average change in contrast, and so this group had a good, good response. Diabetic retinopathy, very small group of three patients, uh, but the average acuity change was great, and uh, marked expansion of the visual field and good improvement of contrast. This was an amazing, uh, one, um, one patient had a complete resolution of the blind spot. You know, with the histoplasmosis, the retinal scar, you get a very dense scotoma. And after three days of treatment, she had complete resolution of that blind spot, totally gone, which was amazing. 
Only one patient with cone dystrophy. This is a rare hereditary disorder, uh, but there was an average of five letters improvement and a moderate change in the visual field. So there's a lot of uh, uh, studies done in the literature looking at ozone and eye diseases, and most of the work was done by Sylvia Mendez. And in her series, over 90% of patients improved in one way or the other, either subjective symptoms or visual function. Um, and these are the theories that she has in terms of uh, why the vision improves and protect, stimulates protective enzyme systems, increases the oxygen supply to the tissues, regulates synthesis and degradation of ATP, uh, rehabilitation uh, at the eye in early stages prevents deterioration of visual function. Uh, this is a European study uh, done in Siena, Italy. Hundreds of patients, they're talking about 70% improvement of dry macular degeneration, usually 15 treatments twice weekly, followed by maintenance therapy. And I think that's the key is maintenance. And that's why one of the reasons I love the rectal ins insufflation, because these folks can go home and do the treatments on their own. Uh, another uh, Italian study, the majority of patients showed an improvement in treating uh, age-related uh, retinal maculopathy. Uh, this was a retrospective study done showing an average improvement of uh, two-tenths vision of their acuity in 80% of the patients treated. And ozone therapy could be a good therapeutic choice for patients suffering SMD, senile macular degeneration, because these folks don't have any help. Most of the times the eye doctor will tell you there's no treatment available when you have dry macular, vitamins aren't going to help you, uh, get your affairs in order. Uh, but every patient that I've treated with dry macular degeneration has an improvement of their vision, uh, which is very, very rewarding. Uh, Dr. Mendenez has a lot of uh, uh, work done with uh, retinitis pigmentosa. And retinitis pigmentosa seems to be an epidemic in, in Cuba. And her series of retinitis pigmentosa is extremely favorable. She did a glaucoma study of 200 patients. And after reading this study, this is what really stimulated me to begin using uh, rectal insufflation as a routine procedure in my practice for patients. So one thing that I'm very curious is what is the main therapeutic modality? Unfortunately, when patients come to me, I'm doing microcurrent, light therapy, pulse electromagnetic field, and ozone. What is really doing the work? So I put an application in for a national study looking at microcurrent stimulation, pulse electromagnetic field, light therapy, rectal ozone, and a sham procedure. We never like to use the word double blind study when we're doing an ophthalmology study. A sham procedure. <laughs> And I want to see what has the greatest effect. And then the next part of the study is to combine the two best to see if they have an additive effect. And then do a long-term, one-year pilot study. So I almost have IRB approval for this. So I'm keeping my fingers crossed. Now, intravitreal injections in ophthalmology are one of the most commonly performed procedures done today. And this is the standard method of delivering and any angiogenesis inhibitors in the treatment of wet. Also for uh, branch vein occlusion, central vein occlusion, a lot of vascular uh, problems in the eye, they're using the angiogenesis inhibitor factors, and this is a list of them right here. Now here are some facts about these injections. Well, they're needed every four to eight weeks. And during a two-year period, uh, most of the studies show there is a modest decrease in best corrected visual acuity in all the treatment groups ranging from 0.8 to 1.7 letters. So in spite of these injections, they're still losing vision. Now, uh, the proportion of patients who maintained a gain of three lines or more at 96 weeks were 30 to 33%, which is poor. But this part really really irked me. The primary endpoints were being maintenance of visual acuity defined as losing fewer than 15 EDTRS letters. In other words, they can lose 15 letters 
and they determined the stable. Now, what kind of study is that? I mean, it's so clear that Big Pharma has fudged this data to make it look effective. And these injections cost over 2,000 per injection. And there's been over 100,000 patients, probably much more than that treated to date. So put a pencil to that. Very expensive therapy that just doesn't work. <coughs> Intravitreal ozone. Could this become the standard method of treatment of wet macular degeneration? I've been thinking about this for the last two years. I wake up in the middle of the night. This has to be the way to go. Um, so I decided, uh, you know, I can't treat a human. Fortunate that I live on a ranch. I have a lot of animals. And now we're raising rabbits, uh, New Zealand albino rabbits. So I decided to do a study of intravitreal injection of ozone in a New Zealand albino rabbit. Also, my next phase is to look at, there's a rodent uh, model of wet macular degeneration. So I'm going to be purchasing, I'm also in addition to raising all these other animals, I'm going to be raising <laughs> rodents too at the ranch. So this is um, the New Zealand albino rabbit, Daisy. And she was selected, and I gave a half a cc of ozone uh, 24 gamma into the eye. I was very excited about that. I looked at the eye immediately afterwards. Pupil was slightly dilated. Um, the girls every day in the office checked on the bunny to make sure it was okay. Day one, I looked pretty good. Day two, day three, the rabbit died. I was heartbroken. But we had a bad thunderstorm, and the ranch hand that works at the ranch is an expert raising rabbits. And he said, rabbits get frightened very easily. Um, and it was probably the lightning that killed the rabbit. So I'm wondering, you know, what did I do? So I did a necropsy on the rabbit, the eye, and I compared it to the fellow eye, and I didn't see any difference on growth, gross pathology. So I decided to do another rabbit. <laughs> They're prolific breeders, so we have a constant source of rabbits. <laughs> And this is the rabbit. I'm doing an ocular coherence uh, tomography on the rabbit. Uh, the rabbit eye is very similar to the human eye, so um, get some stabilization. If you're not familiar with ocular coherence tomography, it's a wonderful tool that ophthalmologists are using. It's like taking an eye out of uh, the socket, taking a cross section, looking underneath the microscope. We can actually see all the layers of the retina with ocular coherence tomography. It uses low levels of light. We can see all the layers of the retina. We can measure changes in retinal thickness, toxicity, atrophy. So I thought this was a wonderful tool, because my concern is the ozone gas may be very toxic to the retina. So this is a pre-laser um, measurement. And I took a couple of shots. And this was, uh, the retinal thickness was 97. This is before ozone. Um, the second eye, this is also before ozone, was 128. So after repeated measurements, I assumed it was probably anywhere from 95 to 130 would be normal. So this is um, three days after half a CC. The second rabbit that I ejected did not die. The rabbit's still alive. It's on life support, but it's still alive. <laughs> Just kidding. It's doing very well. <laughs> And this rabbit measured uh, 115 microns, so there's no increase in swelling of the retina. So I can conclude that the intravitreal uh, uh, ozone ejection is safe. So future plans. What I'm looking at is um, intravitreal ozone in a normal retina, uh, a single injection of ozone, and then looking at multiple injections, uh, maybe up to five injections over a period of a month. I want to kind of get to the toxic level to see what I, when I cause damage. After that, I want to treat a rodent model of wet macular degeneration to see if it does have a therapeutic effect. It's one thing injecting a rabbit, there's no change, but will it have a therapeutic effect in the wet macular? I'm really fortunate. Um, I'm, um, I trained at the Shea Eye Institute in Philadelphia, and at that time, Dr. Ralph Eagle was the chief uh, retinal pathologist, now he's at Wills. And I called up Ralph and he remembered who, who I was. And he's going to help me with histopathological exams of all these eyes. 
you know, set of the rabbit eyes are easier to look at all stages. So I really want to publish these animal studies and then apply for an IRB and actually begin clinical studies. But I'm very excited about this in terms of helping all these thousands of patients who desperately need help. And I think that intravitreal ozone may be a brilliant solution to the, to the problem. I encourage you to work with an eye doctor, CYA, uh, because what we're doing is controversial. And you don't want anything to happen in your practice where a patient accuses you of causing vision loss. These are two organizations, the College of Syntonic Optometry and the College of Vision Development. I find that optometrists are probably more willing to work with you collecting the baseline than ophthalmologists. If you have an ophthalmologist in your area that wants to work with you, great, but usually they're very much against integrative treatments. I'm having a, uh, a two-day personal hands-on workshop I really want to empower you as an integrative doctor to know these approaches and how you can comfortably treat patients who have eye problems. So the two-day workshop is going to be held at our Florida Wellness Center. Um, hopefully, not only will you learn something, but you have a lot of fun on the ranch. And we're going to cover evaluation of patients, which are critical. You need to be able to collect this data, pre- and post-op treatment measurements, We'll talk a little bit about nutritional IVs, uh, testing for vitamin deficiencies, the different therapies that I do, frequency-specific microcurrent, uh, tuitions 895, so if you are interested, uh, uh, please email me. We have two dates for that. We have a June date, we have a September date. So don't forget my gift to you. I'm happy to send you as many copies as you want. Um, email me your billing address, how many you like, because the books are not doing me any good sitting in my barn. They need to get out there and be in your office and you can use it as a reference guide. When the patient comes in with an eye problem, look at the material shown to the patient and I think it will be a big help. So I want to thank you very much for your attention. That was a great presentation, Ed. Thank you. Well, we have some time for questions.